that kind of church. <laughs> but we, we truly do have so much going on, so much to celebrate. God is doing so many amazing things on top of all of our graduates, on top of Mother's Day. We're also so excited that you're here because we're kicking off a brand new series called Ohana, and it's going to be from Mother's Day to Father's Day. And so it's a series about being family, being the Ohana of God. What does it look like to be Ohana in the kingdom of God? What does it look like really to be God's Ohana? And what characteristics mark the Ohana of God? And so we're going to learn about abiding and, and in love as family and uh, we're going to dive into these, these things, these truths. And the, the reality is that whether or not you came today with your actual ohana, how many of us know that in the house of God, we're all ohana, amen? So turn to the brother, turn to the sister sitting next to you and say, we are ohana. Go ahead, tell them that. We are ohana. It's true. Yes, whether or not that person lives in your home, they might come from another community, they might come from another country. It doesn't matter if they're older, they're younger. How many of us know as children of God, we are all his ohana, amen? And that's one of the beautiful things. That's what I love about living in Hawaii. This is such a special place. If you've ever been anywhere else in the world, this is such a special place because we get that unique perspective on the beautiful diversity of God's ohana. Amen? Just looking around the room, it is so beautiful to see. And so as we come into this series, we know that we were all born into different families, right? Right? So when we come into this space, we're coming from different pasts. It's true, we're coming from different experiences, different backgrounds. And if we're honest, we bring different hurts too. Hurts from our homes, hurts from our families. But here's the truth. The truth is that even though we were born into different families, all of us were born again into the same family. We are all God's ohana. And so we're going to learn what it looks like to be the ohana of God. Because when it comes to being family, there's one value, one characteristic that stands above and beyond the rest. It's the most important thing. And if we only had one week in this entire series to talk about one thing, it would be this value. And we find it in scripture, Jesus talks about it, and Jesus is the head of the family. And so let's hear about this all-important value that marks us and sets us apart. Jesus was asked a very important question in Matthew chapter 22. They said, teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? It was almost like their way of saying, Jesus, if you had to summarize it, if you had to boil it down to one thing, Jesus, what would you say is the most important thing in life? And Jesus replied, here it is, love. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment, and the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. Jesus is saying, if you had to boil it down to one thing, if you had to summarize the whole Bible, if you had to summarize all of Scripture, everything the prophets have ever said, all the commandments, Jesus said it really comes down to one main thing. It's all about love. It's all about love. And Jesus said, if you miss everything else, catch this. We have to be a people marked by love. In fact, Jesus said that it is this love that defines us. It is this love that sets us apart. This is what Jesus says to any who would follow him. In John 13, 35, Jesus says, By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples. How? If you love one another. Jesus is saying this is it. If you forget everything else, this is the most important thing. Love. Love one another. It is love that will set you apart. It, will, it is love that will define you. And that got me thinking, you know, there are so many different groups, different organizations, corporations, companies, and they all have that thing, right? That, that value that drives them, that value that defines them. And I wonder, you know, pop quiz today, if you know some of these defining values for these different companies or corporations. So for example, 
Nike, what is their defining value? It is just, just do it, right? Nike wants you to know that they are a company who is all about action, right? Just do it, right? Oh, that, that was easy. We all know that one, okay? Let's see if you know this one, okay? Subway, eat. You guys got it. A lot of people eat Subway in this corner. <laughs> hey, 8 o'clock was about 50-52. But yeah, Subway's motto is eat fresh, right? What do they, they want you to know, hey, we're not like all those other guys, greasy, fried, fast food. No, we want you to eat fresh, right? Speaking of greasy, fried, fast food, what's McDonald's slogan? It's ba da ba 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 I'm, I'm loving it, right? Come on, let's be honest. Who doesn't love... Chicken McNuggets, French fries, McDonald's? You're lying. You're all lying. Everybody loves it. I see you guys at McDonald's. Don't tell me you, don't, you guys don't eat McDonald's, right? Yesterday uh, was my daughter's piano recital, and we came straight to church from her recital. We were both super, super hungry, and we went to McDonald's. We split a 20-piece chicken nuggets. My daughter's eight years old. She ate half the chicken nuggets. I was like, that is not how this works. Okay, you guys are doing pretty good so far, but this is the final one. Let's see if you can all get it. Let's say it together. Disneyland is the? Happy Space Ooh, I'm sorry. That's actually incorrect. They recently just changed it. It was, but now it's the costliest place on earth. <laughs> they just made that change not too long ago. <laughs> so we know the slogans. We know the defining values for all these different groups. But what about us? right? What if Christians had to have something that defined us, right? I think Jesus would agree that our slogan would be something like Christians, love God, love people, because that's what Jesus said was the most important thing. And the Bible talks about this, that it is love that is the most important thing. I mean, think about the Apostle Paul, right? He said, when you guys get together, you can have all the, the gifts, you can have all these spiritual gifts. You can have all, you can have prophecy. You can have teaching. You can have it all. You can pray like, you know, amazing prayers. But Paul would say, but if you don't have love, you have nothing. You've got nothing, right? He says you can have faith. You can have hope. You can have love. But the greatest of these is love, love. Now, how many of us know it's one thing to have a slogan, but it's another thing entirely to, to own that slogan or to live that slogan, right? Like sometimes, I'll be honest, I hear different company slogans. I think, really? That's what you guys are about? I'll be honest. I went to Subway the other day and I thought, eat fresh? I don't know. I think maybe some days, but not so fresh. Maybe fresh is relative, you know, some days. I don't know, you know? We went to McDonald's, you know? I'm loving it. I, yeah, I was loving it in the moment. Then I got up here two hours later to speak. I was not loving it, let me tell you. <laughs> Not loving it so much. I was falling asleep, you know, too many French fries, right? Disneyland, right? The happiest place on earth. Have you ever seen a kid just having a total meltdown at Disneyland? It is ironic. It's like, kid, this is the happiest place on earth, you know, and you see those parents standing in line two hours, three hours, thinking, I paid how much to, to be here and do this, right? And so it's, sometimes there's a disconnect, right? Hey, nothing against... United Airlines, if you work for United, no offense, but you know, we all know it's been in the headlines, you know, a lot of controversy surrounding United Airlines, you know, fights on the flights, people getting dragged out of your seats, you know, but do you know what United's slogan is? It's flying the friendly skies. <laughs> and, and so, you know, there's a disconnect, but you know, it's easy to, to laugh and it's easy to point fingers at others, but again, let's be honest, if this is what we are supposed to be known for, how are we doing? How are we doing? Right? When the world looks at us, is this what we're known for? Right? I wonder. And actually, we don't have to wonder because I actually came across a recent uh, survey that was conduct conducted of over 3,000 Americans, adults living in America. And this was put out by the Episcopalian Church, right? They, they surveyed over 3,000 people. Uh, they were Christian, they were, uh, belonged to other religions, they were, some were non-religious, right? Interestingly, when they asked them about the importance of Jesus across the board, Christian, non-religious, belonged to other religions, a vast majority, about 84%, said that they agreed that Jesus was an important spiritual figure. So we're almost in complete agreement about Jesus, 
But then when the question shifted to Jesus' followers and what they thought about Christians, they were able to choose from different words that they felt generally, you know, characterized Christians, and it told a little bit of a different story. Now, interestingly, and I know that the words are small, so I'll read the, the findings to you. When the Christians answered, they overwhelmingly associated themselves with positive traits. Number one answer, 57%, Christians are giving. Uh, 56% said Christians are compassionate. 55% said Christians are loving. However, there was a fundamental disconnect between how Christians viewed themselves and how the rest of society saw them. When asked the very same question, those who identified as non-religious had some different words to choose. Number one answer, 55%. Hypocritical, 54% judgmental, 50% self-righteous, followed by arrogant, unforgiving, and disrespectful. And Jesus said, you know how the world is going to know you? They're going to know you by your love. So that means that we've got a major disconnect on our hands. And I was thinking about that, and I was like, where did, where did this disconnect come from? Because this is not what's supposed to define us. We are supposed to be a people known by love. And I thought, I wonder if part of the problem has to do with maybe not understanding the kind of love that Jesus is talking about. Because when we read these passages, when we read that word love, do we really know what that love means? See, in the English language, unfortunately, we only have one word for love. And so I can love my wife. I also love pizza, you know? I really love Jesus. I love movies. I absolutely love my kids. I love to go surfing, right? It's like, okay, but obviously all those things aren't, you know, they don't deserve the same, right? But we only have one word, so it gets kind of lost, right? So in Jesus' day, they had different words for different kinds of loves. They were a lot more specific. So based on the context, they would employ these different words. And so if they were talking about a familial love, like a family love, they had a word. The word was storge in the Greek. If they were talking about a friendship kind of love, like I love my friends, right? The word then was phileo. Not the fish sandwich from McDonald's, right? <laughs> phileo as in like Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love, right? It's a, it's a brotherly love. This is my, these are my, my bradas, you know? These are my friends, right? Uh, eros, the Greek word eros is where we get the English word erotic, and that was their word for romantic love. And so they have all these different words for love, but when Jesus talks about love, he's not talking about any of these kinds of loves. None of those words capture the essence of the kind of love that Jesus is talking about. Because when Jesus talks about love, he uses a completely separate word altogether. And if you've been in church or Christian circles for any amount of time, you know what that word is. It's the word agape. Agape love is actually a love that is not of this world. In other words, it is a divine love. It is the love that God models to us. And in Romans chapter 5, you know, Paul's talking about the way that we love each other, right? Like worldly love, right? Human love. And then after talking about that, he says in verse 8, but God, creating a contrast here, he's saying this is the way we love, but God demonstrates his own love, agape love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. What the Bible tells us time and in time and time again is that God does not love the way the world loves. He does not love. He demonstrates his own love. See, because how many of us know, and I'll, how many of us would be honest, I would be the first to admit that oftentimes my love is motivated by emotions, feelings, personal desires. Another thing is my love can be conditional at times. It can be based on merit. Oh, well, let me see. Does this person deserve my love? Am I going to get love in return? Right? It's kind of conditional in that state, right? Also, our love can fluctuate, right? Sometimes we're feeling it, sometimes not so much. And how many of us know that love can fade away altogether, right? That happens in human love. It can be selfish. It can be self-seeking. It can be concerned with its own interests and satisfaction, 
But the Bible tells us that God demonstrates his own love for us. How many of us are so thankful this morning that God doesn't love the way we love, but that God has his own love? Amen. God demonstrates his own love for us. Hallelujah. His love is not like our love. His love is not motivated by feelings. His love is not driven by emotions. We never have to wake up wondering, gee, I wonder if God woke up on the right side of the bed today. Wonder what kind of mood he's going to be in. He stays the same. He never changes. His love is not reactionary. It's not based on our behavior. It's not based on how much we deserve it or how much we've earned it. His love is a conscious, active decision, and it is steadfast. It is steady. It is not based on circumstances. Also, God's love is selfless. God sacrificially lays down his comforts, his conveniences, even his very life for the sake of others. God's love is enduring. It is not fickle. It is not fleeting. It is steadfast and unchanging. It is a love that remains regardless of circumstances, regardless of what we do or if, if we reciprocate that love. Romans 8, chapter 38 through 39, Paul says these powerful words. He says, For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. What a powerful reminder that there is nothing, no power on earth, no force in this world that can change God's love for us. Not even you. Not even you have the power to separate yourself from God's love. <clears throat> How many of us have also found agape love to be a transformative love? It has changed us, right? God's love has the power to transform no other power on earth has the power to change a person's heart but love. Love is the only thing that can change a person's life. It can bring healing and restoration, right? It tears down walls, tears down barriers, builds bridges. It fosters unity and harmony. It pushes us towards forgiveness and reconciliation. The other thing that's amazing about agape love, God's love, is that it is inclusive. It is not exclusive. It, does not, uh, it is not selective. It's not only for a few. God's love is available to all, regardless of your age, regardless of your background, regardless of your past, regardless of your ethnicity, regardless of your culture, regardless of where you come from. No one is excluded from the love of God. His love sees beyond the surface, sees beyond what is external, and sees the inherent value and worth and dignity of every individual. The other thing that's amazing about agape love is that it is not passive. It is not indifferent. It is not waiting for us to take the first step. His love is engaged. His love is active. His love pursues. He is constantly looking for ways to come after us, to serve and to minister to those in need. This is the kind of divine love that God extends to us. This is what agape love is. But not only that, here's the amazing thing, church. Not only is agape love something we receive from God, but agape love is something we are meant to then extend to others. Just as we have received, we give. In fact, we saw that passage earlier where Jesus says, this is how everyone will know you are my disciples if you love one another. Again, this is the kind of love he's talking about. How do we know that? Well, he tells us in the verse right before, he says, a new command I give you, agape one another. How? What's the standard? How do we know we're doing it? Agape one another as I have agape you. How are we to love one another? The same way I loved you. So you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love, if you agape one another. Man, I don't know about you, but I read that passage and I think, oh, great. <laughs> oh, that's all? You know, we just got to love each other the same way the Son of God loved us, the same way this perfect, sinless man, the holiest man who ever lived, the same way he loved us? He died on a cross for us, right? I can't even, uh, you know, make the bed some mornings. You know what I mean? It's just like, this is an impossible love. 
It's an impossible love. How are we ever going to live up to this? How will the world ever know that we are his disciples if we can't love the way he does? And so I want to uh, share this final passage with you this morning that kind of uh, unpacks this. And I switched out all of our English words for love, and I replaced it with this love that Jesus is talking about. Now, if you're a Bible scholar, it's not going to be grammatically perfect, but hopefully it gets the point across, okay? Uh, the words are a little small, so I'm going to read it to you. This comes from 1 John chapter 4, and in verse 7 through 12, John writes, Dear friends, let us agape one another, for agape comes from God. Everyone who agapes has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not agape does not know God, because God is agape. This is how God showed his agape among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is agape. Not that we agape God, but that he agape us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God so agape us, we also ought to agape one another. No one has ever seen God, but if we agape one another, God lives in us and his agape is made complete in us. You see, the reason why I think there's such a disconnect coming from the church and why so many people perceive us to be hypocritical, could it be perhaps because oftentimes we profess the love of God, but do we possess the love of God? Do we really have this love that comes from God? Because here's the truth of the matter, church. We cannot produce this love on our own. You and I, we don't have the power. We don't have the goodness. We don't have the love within us to love this way, the way we talked about, the way God loves. We can't do it. We can't produce it. No amount of energy, no amount of work, no amount of spiritual maturity, no amount of effort is going to produce the kind of love the world needs, this kind of transformational love. It has to come through God. And I think where we get hung up is that we try so hard to love in our own power because we think, oh, that's what Christians are known for. But we love in our own strength. We love with a human love, and it ends up being broken and fallen when we're really meant to express the agape love of God that comes from him. So the first thing we have to acknowledge is that we are powerless to produce this kind of love on our own. It's just not going to come from us. I'm you know, left to myself apart from the active, real-time intervention of the Holy Spirit. I am a very unloving person, truly. Um, anyone who knew me like before, <laughs> before I really got serious about Jesus, they'll come up here and they'll tell you. Mom, you know, don't come up here. <laughs> Chris, stay seated, right? These guys knew me from before, right? They'll be the first to vouch, right? It is any time I'm ever loving is only by the power of the Holy Spirit. I don't have love in and of myself, right? None of us do. None of us can love in this way. We have to acknowledge that we're not going to do it on our own. We can't produce this kind of love that the world really needs, this love that sets us apart, that proves that we are his disciples, right? So secondly, we have to acknowledge that the only way then that we can give this love, the Bible says, is if you don't know God, then you don't know love. Because God is love. And if you don't love, then you don't know God. Because God is love. How many of us know we can't do something we don't know? We can't profess the love of God if we don't possess the love of God, right? Uh, well, we can certainly profess it, but we can't express it. Amen? And so we need to first know the God who is love. It's like anything, right? It's like math. Math is a perfect example. You cannot fake math. Believe me, I tried. <laughs> okay? Try to fake it till I make it, you know, one of those things, barely pass. Anyway, and so I, I can't do calculus if I don't know calculus. Forget it, right? I can't speak Korean if I don't know Korean, right? And in the same way, I cannot love if I don't know the one who is love. I cannot agape love if I don't know agape love, right? To know God is to know love, no God, no love. That's like a Christian clothing brand. Anyway, but anyway, it's not original to me. How many of us know that agape love is a fruit of the Spirit? Not a fruit of effort, 
Not a fruit of like trying. It's a fruit of the spirit, right? So as God lives in us, as his spirit empowers us, only then will we be able to truly love this way. He will, love will be the byproduct of a life that is abiding in him and he abiding in us. The Bible says, if you abide in me and I abide in you, you will bear much fruit. One of those fruits will be love. But apart from me, God says, you can do nothing. I sort of want to illustrate this. So I want to welcome up. They just found out that they're going to be a part of this. So give a hand to Michael and Skye as they come up here. I want to give them a big shout out because they just tied the knot this past Tuesday. Newlyweds. Okay, so Skye, you stand here. Michael, here you go, okay? This fan represents our love, okay? But like we said, on our own, we're going to be powerless to love, right? And so, Michael, can you fan Sky? Go ahead. Try your best, okay? <laughs> I don't know. Sky, are you getting anything there? No? Come on, Michael's. Look at Keep going, Michael. He's trying real hard. I see a, like a strand maybe blowing. But, man, his, his arms are going to burn out eventually. He's trying his best, right? And how many of us know we try our best to love but left to our own devices, it's just not going to happen. We're going to get burnt out. We're going to get sore. We're going to give up and uh, have nothing to show for it. Or, you know, if Michael's not careful, he might get tired and he might bash Sky over the head, you know? And so we don't want to do that either. But how many of us know that all it takes is to plug into the source, the source of power, right? That's all. Now, now Michael doesn't have to wave his hands he could just stand there and love Sky. Look at that. It's just like a L'Oreal commercial, right? Look at that. It's just like feel all that air. It's summer. It's hot, right? So, yeah. And, and this is what we were created to do. We, we are conductors. We, we are conductors of God's power and his love, right? It's just flowing through. Michael doesn't have to, like, exert himself. He's just like a conduit for God's love. Give these guys a hand. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Sky. Oh, that feels good. I'm going to keep that on me. Woo. Amen. Amen. And so that's the picture we get, right? That it's not our love. It's not our power. It's not our strength. We're not the source of love. But as we stay connected to him, right, God promises to provide all that we need, all that we need, right? And as we close, I, I just want to share to me a perfect story of this uh, example, right? And uh, how many of you are familiar with the story of Corey Ten Boom? Do you guys know who Corey Ten Boom is? Yeah, she was a survivor of the Holocaust. And um, it, it's such a powerful story. Her and her family were all uh, arrested. They were all imprisoned in concentration camps. And uh, Corey Ten Boom was the only one from her family who survived. She survived her parents. And she, she survived her best friend, Betsy, who was her sister. Her sister died in the concentration camps. Corey Ten Boom was the only one who survived. <laughs> and after the war was over, she began to go and all over, all over the world, really, to different churches, to different places. And she began to tell her story. She began to talk about the love and the faithfulness of God in the midst of the horror she experienced. And actually, after the 8 o'clock service, uh, Pastor Rich's mom, Mrs. Fuel, came up to me and she said, I actually got to hear Corey Ten Boom in person share this story that you're about to hear. Powerful. But she writes of all of this. If you want to know her story, she writes about all of it in her best-selling book, The Hiding Place. The Hiding Place. Because what was her family's crime? Hiding the Jews during World War II. That's what they were arrested for. That's what they were imprisoned for. That's what they died for. So her book is called The Hiding Place. And I want to read to you just a story from The Hiding Place talking about the love that God gives us. She says, It was at a church service in Munich that I saw him, a former SS man, who had stood guard at the shower room door in the processing center at Ravensbrück. That was the camp that they were at. He was the first of our actual jailers that I had seen since that time. And suddenly, it was all there. The room full of mocking men 
the heaps of clothing. My sister, Betsy's pain blanched face. He came up to me as the service was emptying, beaming and bowing. How grateful I am for your message, Fräulein, he said. To think that as you say, he has washed my sins away. His hand was thrust out to shake mine. And I, who had preached so often to people the need to forgive, kept my hand at my side. Even as the angry, vengeful thoughts boiled through me, I saw the sin of them. Jesus Christ had died for this man. Was I going to ask for more? Lord Jesus, I prayed, forgive me and help me to forgive him. I tried to smile. I struggled to raise my hand. I could not. I felt nothing, not the slightest spark of warmth or charity. And so again, I breathed a silent prayer. Jesus, I prayed, I cannot forgive him. Give me your forgiveness. As I took his hand, the most incredible thing happened. From my shoulder, along my arm, and through my hand, a current seemed to pass from me to him, while into my heart sprang a love for this stranger that almost overwhelmed me. And so I discovered that it is not on our own forgiveness any more than our own goodness that the world's healing hinges, but on his. When he tells us to love our enemies, he gives, along with the command, the love itself. You see, as Jesus tells us to love one another, he doesn't just give us the command. He gives us the power. He gives us the love because he knows, he knows we won't be able to do this on our own. Could you imagine being in her shoes? Could you imagine trying to muster up the mercy and the forgiveness for this person? It wasn't going to come from her. It had to come from another source, the source who is love. Amen. Just recently, like on my way to church last night, I, I stumbled upon this video. I wasn't even looking for it, but there it was. It was like in my feed. Have you guys been following this bishop, this Orthodox bishop who got stabbed in the pulpit? Have you guys seen that story? Man, this Assyrian-speaking Orthodox Christian bishop who, who ministers out in Australia, he was in his church. They were having mass. And while he's like preaching the word of God, uh, a Muslim guy rushes the pulpit and just starts stabbing him to, to death. But miraculously, he survived. And after his recovery, his miraculous recovery, I mean, this video just came out. Like, it is brand new, right? He's standing up there giving his first message back, really. But now he has an eye patch over one eye. He says, by the, and I'm going to paraphrase what he's saying, but you go watch the movie for yourself. He's saying it's like by the grace of God that I'm alive today. But I did lose my eye in the attack. He says, you know what? I prayed to God, Lord, take my eye as a token of my sacrifice. He said, these Muslim brothers and sisters, they don't see you. If I can give my vision so that they could see, I'll gladly do it. Because that's nothing compared to what my Lord gave so that I could see. And he prays for and he, he extends forgiveness to his attacker, saying, I hope this brother finds Jesus. How many of us know that supernatural love? That is divine love. That's the kind of love the, the world looks at and says, wow, those are followers of Jesus. That's the kind of love that defines us. But it's a love that is not of this world. It comes through our intimate abiding with Jesus. I want to share one more image, and uh, I'll put it up in just a little bit. Maybe you guys will throw it up. But it's Mother's Day, and she has no idea that I'm going to do this, but my mom is here, and, uh, you know, I have definitely been the recipient of my mom's love, and many of you have been recipients of my mom's love, and this picture might not mean much to you, but to me, it means everything, because I know the source of where my mom's love comes from, and 
Shortly after I moved out of the house, I mean immediately after, she turned it into her office. It was like <laughs> overnight. But there she has her desk area, right? And this is like her secret place. And I took a picture of this because every time I pass by, whenever I'm visiting, whenever I pass by the room and I see this, I think that's the answer right there. Every time I visit the house, she's there every morning spending hours with Jesus here in the word of God, connected to him, abiding in his love, staying connected to the source. And I thought, man, that is where love comes from. It just comes from this intimate relationship with Jesus. And so I know that's true of so many of our moms. Moms, you guys have been an expression of unconditional love to us. You loved us through our worst moments you loved us when we were at our ugliest. You loved us, many of us, back into a place of health, back into a place of victory. You loved us out of darkness and into light. So thank you all for being that source of Jesus' unconditional love. Would you bow your heads as we close in a word of prayer and reflection? And as always, every week, we make our notes and, our, and these questions available because we don't want this to just be for now. We don't want these words to fall to the ground. We want you to, to take these words and cherish them in your heart. And so wherever you're doing life, whoever you're doing life with, whoever your ohana is, it doesn't have to be your blood ohana, but if you're sitting around the table as family, if you're gathered with your ohana group, if you're, uh, you know, going through life together with people, then you can go through these questions and take the next step. And so I made a statement earlier that I believe that the Bible makes it clear that as Christians, we should be known first and foremost for our love. I wonder if you agree with that statement. Do you agree that as believers, more than anything else, we should be known for our love? You guys can talk about that among yourselves. Secondly, if you believed that to be true, then looking at the church today, looking at the state of the world, looking at the state of the church, why do you think it is that we are generally perceived to be unloving? Why, why the disconnect? Right? Let's, let's really take an honest look at ourselves as a people, as the ohana of God, because we're supposed to be known for our love. So why is there a disconnect? Talk about it. Sure, the media probably plays a, a part in it, in the way that it portrays us, but is that all there is? Is there more to the story? Question three is, what do you think Jesus meant by the words, this is how the world, this is how everyone will know you. It is by your love for one another. What did he mean by that? And what kind of love do you think he was talking about? And as you think about that, do you think that we are doing a good job of communicating that love? And if not, how can we grow in our ability to love the way that Jesus calls us to? And then finally, I just want you to take a look inside your own heart right? And, and ask yourself, in what ways have you been transformed by the love of God? In what ways has God's love transformed you? In what ways has God's love transformed your heart, transformed your life? In what ways has God's love transformed the way that you love? And then as you do an honest inventory of your own life, okay, think about this. This is pretty significant, right? Jesus says the most important thing in life is love. That is his guiding, like, lens. It's the lens through which he sees everything. So whenever Jesus tells us to do something, it's about love. Whenever Jesus tells us not to do something, listen, it's not because he's trying to deprive you. It's not because he's trying to prevent you from enjoying life or having a good time or being happy. It's not because he's trying to restrict you. Again, what is Jesus's lens? It's love. So if Jesus is saying, don't do this, it is because that thing will make you a more unloving person. That's his rubric. It's not even about good and bad. It's about loving and unloving. 
He's not trying to make you into a good person. He's trying to make you into a person of love. And so as we look at our own lives, let's be honest. Are there things that we have permitted? Are there things that we are permitting that if we're honest with ourselves, we would say, you know what? I think that thing is making me a more unloving person. And maybe I need to go on a journey to figure out how to remove that from my life so that I can grow in my love. So that's a journey between you and the Holy Spirit. You can invite those you do life with into that journey if you want accountability, if you need, you know, um, support. That's what those groups are there for. And I'm so grateful that coming out of our last series, there are so many different groups that are being birthed. So have these conversations together. Uh, go on this journey together. And I pray that as we go on this journey, we would not only profess the love of God, but that we would possess the love of God so that we can express the love of God to a world that is in dying need of a new kind of love. Amen. Amen. Well, God bless you guys this weekend. Moms, we love you. Happy Mother's Day. Feel free to stick around. We have food. We have refreshments. Uh, you don't have to hurry off. Kids, love on your moms. Pamper them. Don't let them lift a finger. Bless your moms this weekend. Until next week, God bless. We love you guys.